Okay. Uh, so we are in the last class, so we probably can give a couple of minutes for if anybody else wants to join. Um, so one thing, if you probably have noticed, uh, along with the slides, so the slides are here. Along with them, I also put some video as well. So the part two of the video is essentially still recording, I guess, or like still processing. So let's hope that it does it. So there's like still 12 minutes left to process. So, uh, so one thing that I have done is I, I realized that it's, these topics require more than two hours to talk each of these and to go in through the detail, to go in the detail of it. And not everybody in the class might be interested in all the derivations and the details. So I have tried to, let's say, go a little bit slower in these videos, which is probably like a maybe two, two and a half hour video for each of these. Uh, for This is primarily for those interested in all the details. Like if you want to know how the derivations are coming in, everything that's probably gone in there. So that uh, if, you, if you think of that, we have a two hour class, we start about 10 minutes late, we leave, finish 10 minutes early, and we have a 10 minute break in the middle, which essentially leaves us effectively a one and a half hour class. So ideally we are looking at a quality 60 to 70 minutes of lecture content. And I can't teach you dynamic aeroelasticity in 60 to 70 minutes, right? So it's, uh, Impossible. Let, let's put it that way. Okay. So I've tried to record these things and put it out there. I'm, this is primarily for those who are interested in all the details and also to help you prepare for your exams. So I'm also going to, this week, I'm putting up the videos for the rest of it as well, which I feel that it's, uh, we have not been able to cover all the details in the class. We can't go through every derivation, how everything is being formed, which would probably help your later course as well to kind of like build on this in a way. So uh, if you go into the lectures, uh, in the next days, you will see that the videos will be there for all of the f four topics or three topics that we did. Uh, Self-excited system, static, and dynamic. So dynamic is uh, the second part of it is post-processing, and I'm going to put it up before the end of today. The rest of it will also be post-processed, and before the end of the week, you will have all of them ready, So, which will help you to prepare for your exams as well. And uh, in the videos, if you, uh, okay, I'll probably just walk you through the thing. And in the, if you look at it, the last part of it, I'm also having a problem that I'm solving in there. Uh, and that should hopefully, let's say here, I'm probably picking up on some important problems that could be helpful for your exams for those who are, uh, let's say, just to motivate you to watch the video as well, if so. Uh, so I, I, I like to put it on YouTube primarily because you can just navigate to whichever part of the video you would like to. As you already know, you can just go to that part of the thing and just look at it rather than having to, uh, let's say, watch the entire two hours of me going slowly about it and boring you completely in a way. So if you want to just look at the problem, you can probably, at the, in the second part, I'll also put up the problem. You can just go to the problem and look at it. Or if you want a particular thing that you want to understand better, you can go and look at it. That's the reason I've just put it in there rather than uh, uh, or on our blackboard, which is probably, let's say, a little bit more primitive system, I would say. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Uh, and I'm more than happy to answer. Either you can use the email or you can use the Blackboard forum, depending on whichever is, fit, is easiest for you. Ideally, I would prefer the Blackboard forum because then that would also help others. Uh, and it's uh, more easy. But if you want to email, then feel free as well, okay, as you go through preparations for your exams. Okay, any, any questions so far from what we have done till date? From static aeroelasticity, vibrations. Uh, so just just to just uh, talk about your exams before we start today's content, is there's going to be 60% of the questions would come from what Tunde has done, or Dr. Ajiji has done, and 30% from what I have done, right? So there's going to be one question from me and two questions from Dr. Ajiji. Okay. So okay, and so okay, so let's dive into the content. For the day. Okay. Okay. So last time we didn't do, we didn't do dynamic. So we we so we did some bit of uh, okay. And uh, another important thing, please do fill the unit surveys. It is very important to understand what you think worked, what you didn't think did not work, and what we can do better. Uh, it's a uh, uh, so that kind of helps us to say okay, we want to keep these things in the course. Next, these are the things that we want to change in the course next year. 
right? I, I know that doesn't directly affect you, that doesn't really help you directly, but it at least helps the people coming in next time as to what content and what part of the course we want to keep and what we do not want to keep in there, okay? Uh, I know that derivations are not useful for our, like, let's say, of interest to everybody. I wouldn't say useful. It's not of direct interest to everybody, but probably it's trying to understand how you can derive something would probably help you right, you know, write equations for more generic cases. But, of course, at the end of the day, not everybody wants to go into all the details, but uh, for those who are, want to understand, the uh, details are in the slides and in the video lectures. And one thing probably I did not talk about, if you look at the video lecture itself that I've recorded, I have not used any of the slides here. So if you look at it, I've not used the slides. It's primarily me talking over and to bore you to death and writing out things slowly. Uh, one of the reasons, for example, see, I'm really, really writing things slowly. So one of the reasoning behind this has been that uh, when somebody is writing, that gives you some time to process. So I can give you a slide and I can go over 100 slides in 60 minutes, but that does not give you a time to process. The reason for writing this equation is for you to think about it, to process the information, rather than just blip, 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 show things to you. And anyway, if you want, this is basically whatever is covered here is exactly the same in the slide material. It, there's nothing different here, just that I'm writing it a little bit slowly to kind of explain as much as I can for each of these to give you time to think about it. So if you open the slide and if you open the video lecture, it's pretty much the same thing. Here I just am writing. On the slide, you already have it in one shot in a way, okay? It's almost pretty much like one-to-one, -one, almost nearly, except maybe small changes, but okay. Any questions so far? Any thoughts? Okay. Okay, so please do fill the unit surveys. I think they should already have the link in your uh, email boxes. Please do fill them. It is very helpful. And uh, I, I, I said, like, people who find uh, errors in my notes get a chocolate. I think please do pick up a chocolate, even if you're here in the class, even if you have not found an error. Uh, when you're leaving or during the break, uh, I hope you can get everybody some, something. And, of course, you don't have, you're not obligated to pick it up, okay? Okay, so just an overview, we'll start with some recap, some introduction into dynamic aeroelasticity. In the first lecture, we saw some videos about flutter, how things were breaking up, how things were flying away, uh, and we're going to look at some basic uh, impl So we'll focus more on the analysis rather than on the derivation today. Okay, so the derivation is there in the notes, it's there in the video for you to derive it. I'll walk through it a little bit faster but it's more explained slowly on the video, and it's there also there in the slides, if you want to look at it. I'm more than happy to answer questions, but we'll try to understand what these equations of motion mean, and uh, try to, let's say, make a critical analysis of it, right? So if you, come, if you are given a system tomorrow as a designer, how do you understand if flutter would happen in the system? That is what we want to try to understand. And finally, we'll try to look at a problem just at, uh, before we complete the class today, just to give you an idea of an uh, important problem. Okay? So, good. Okay? Good. Okay. So, we have so far talked about some aeroelasticity, concepts of divergence, and so on. For, we looked at divergence for a rigid versus flexible wing last time, and we used what's called a segment method, where we said, you know, we, instead of having a flexible wing, why don't we take the flexible wing as segments of rigid? as rigid and see how this would work, right? Okay. But by the end of today, we want to move ahead a little bit. Uh, one thing that we saw last time was we were assuming that uh, things were static in a way. There was no time varying, time variation. But this time we'll look at something that's, there's time, some time varying phenomena. And we look at what this flutter. So we had this thing kind of like doing this and suddenly doing very fast and then flying away. Right? I don't want to break my hand. But. Uh, so that's what's called as a critical flutter speed. When does it suddenly kind of like the oscillations that were happening, when does it become uncontrolled? So up to a certain point, if you look at the aircraft wing, it keeps doing this, right? If you looked at out of the window. But it doesn't suddenly start to doing very f fast, right? So that means that when it's doing this, it's kind of being damped out. The oscillations are damping out. But at some certain point, the damping is no longer there, that the oscillations become uncontrolled. So we want to find what is the point at which it would change from damping out to becoming uncontrolled. And that is the point of flutter, or critical flutter speed. So at this particular air speed, the wing will start to oscillate uncontrollably. If we know that, then we can design our aircraft, wind turbines, Formula One cars, even normal cars, that they don't start to flutter, 
right? So there's something called a panel flutter and a lot of these things. We will not go into the details of that, but just to just simplistically think that the system is doing this, and it, if you leave it, it would stop. But then at some point, it might start to doing very violently, and then it, after a certain point, the structure cannot withstand that load, and it breaks. We want to find what is this point when it starts to, uh, let's say, vibrate uncontrollably. We don't want to worry about when it will break. Right? We want to. We do not want it to vibrate uncontrollably. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? I was shaking my hand quite a bit. My hand is paining now. Okay. Uh, yeah, like like we said, so we want to find these natural frequencies or call this critical sort of speed. When when does this happen? Okay. Okay, I'm not going to read through all of these things because it's uh, probably already there and uh, you can probably read through them. Uh, so one thing that is probably important for us to think about is a lot of things here is, uh, uh, let's say, dynamic. For example, let's say, you, if you think of the aerodynamic lift and forces, lift and pitching moments, the lift is uh, changing because of the uh, oscillations or because of the movement. And because the movement is changing the lift, that is changing the force, so force is causing a change in the movement. So it's like, it's like a coupled phenomena. So because the force is changing, the displacement is changing, or the movement or the velocity is changing. And because the velocity is changing, that's changing your aerodynamic forces. So that's what happens in dynamic aeroelasticity. These two things are coupled. They're no longer separate out because there's no longer, so because there's a time variation now. So because the force changes, that speed of oscillation changes, the amplitude changes, now that changes the forces again. Now that kind of changes the amplitude again. Right, so it's like, it's like, a, uh, something that's like going around in circles in a way. So we don't want to go around in circles, so we never want to enter into that loop at all. That's our whole idea to look at it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, so basically I'm saying the same thing that I've already talked about so far. It's catastrophic, it can, uh, you know, uh, become uncontrolled and so on and so forth, and the oscillations increase with time and eventually it self-destructs, right? Okay. Okay, so I think probably what's important, I would just spend a couple of minutes on this one. I, would, I don't want to read through all the previous slides because that's essentially what I've been telling for the last five, ten minutes. So, so what we have done here, if you remember from your previous problem that we did in static aeroelasticity, we have the same airfoil. Only thing that is different is now we have added an additional spring here. So let me just go in there. Go to the slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have added this additional slide in here. Okay. So there's a linear spring that is added in here. So what is this linear spring? So when we looked at static aeroelasticity, we had this airfoil, and we said that about the flexural axis, it's kind of doing up and down. It's like you know, like a rotating, like a torsional motion. Now what we are saying, it's not just going up and down, like a like a torsional motion. But it's also doing up and down, so it's like this. Okay, so we can think of this as a two degree of freedom problem. So if we, if I separate this out, I can say one is one motion is going up and down, and one motion is doing this twisting. So we have represented here the up and down motion through this linear spring here, so K Z, and the rota pitching motion through us, uh, let's say, a to rotational spring or a torsional spring K theta. Okay, let me maybe write it out more cleanly here. Uh, yeah, maybe this one is better. So we have the linear and we have the torsional spring. So just to, just to remind you back what we have done so far, we, if you remember we have the aerodynamic center. The aerodynamic center is at which you have the lift and some moments acting there. So you have some kind of a lift acting here, the lift force. And there could also be a moment here, right, MAC. Then you have the flexural axis, which is the axis of the your structural axis or elastic axis at we, about which all the phenomena are happening. Then you, we have introduced a new thing called the center of mass. Last time we never talked about the center of mass. If you go back and look at your notes on static or elasticity, we did not have the center of mass. That's a new thing that we have introduced because we are saying now there's some inertia included in this problem. So there's some dynamic phenomena happening, which means if you think of a very simple case, let's say if you think of your statics, your course on statics, 
you said summation of f equal to zero, or f is nothing but forces, right? So you take uh, sum the forces in x direction, in y direction, and z direction, and then you said it's it's always equal to zero. Now when we looked at dynamics, you said summation of f is equal to m into a. so nothing but your mass, right? So if you think about your courses that you have done, like you looked at some statics where you said the summation of force is zero, which was something like our static aeroelasticity. Now we are looking at dynamic aeroelasticity where we are saying that some inertial effects are coming into picture and we have this mass as well coming in. So now writing a mass for this kind of a complicated shape is a little more difficult, so we can def but then we can always define a center of mass. All right. So we have defined the center of mass here that we have considered. So and we want to see how we can use this center of mass. Second thing I have defined is like my semi-chord length. So uh, I, was, I said there's like a semi-chord here, which is like the middle of the airfoil. I said the distances are B. And we already have uh, defined our distance between the aerodynamic center and the elastic axis as E, right? which we have already done last time, like eccentricity. So I defined two more distances here, just to look at it. So one is the distance between the semi-chord and the flexural axis, which is B into A. So B is the distance, uh, is the length of our semi-chord. A is some non-dimensional number. I can always say B into 1.5 or B into 0.5 or B into 0.25, right? So A is some non-dimensional number, just because I want to write everything in terms of B, uh, right? And then I also define a distance between my uh, flexural axis or elastic axis and the center of mass, okay? B into X. So x a can be again some kind of a non-dimensional number that I'm just multiplying by b so that I can write everything as a fraction. It's just some mathematical jugglery. You can write any, any number in there. You can call it h, and it should still be the same, right? So we are just defining, and so we have a velocity v and an initial angle of attack theta naught, and we are saying that the pitching is happening about theta. We already defined this thing. So we had initial angle of attack theta naught, and there was some pitching or a torsional motion. And we said that arbitrarily that this is, this is some angle theta. One last thing that we have, and we said uh, one thing that we have defined, two things that we have added in now, not one but two, is one is the z. Right? So we are defining a coordinate, which is basically z equal to zero at the flexural axis, and x equal to zero at the semi -chord. So why are we doing this? So last time in static aeroelasticity, we had we had elastic axis about which the airfoil was doing a pitching motion. But now we are saying it's not just doing a pitching motion, but it's also going up and down. So we need to we have two degrees of freedom. One is the pitching motion theta, and the second thing is the up and down motion, right? So we have the z, which is the up and down motion. So we have defined some kind of a coordinate z in order to define our up and down motion here. So we are now we have two degrees of freedom. One is the theta, and one is the z. Okay, so that is just to give you an idea of uh, what we are trying to do here, just to define all the nomenclature and the terms, and then we want to use these measures in order to get our Lagrange equation, right? So if you, uh, if you, if you, we've already always been going back to the Lagrange equation, which means that we want to write the kinetic energy, we want to write potential energy, we want to write the generalized forces, and eventually we want to get the uh, equation of motion, right? So that's been our uh, go-to uh, thing always. Okay, so okay, I'll skip all. So we all also remember the Lagrange equation from what we have done so far. Sure, sure. Let me ask uh, Dr. Oyadiji and come back to you on that if that's okay for you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, because Dr. Ayariji is the one who has put the formula sheet, so I can ask him and check that before I say yes or no to you on that. But I think it will be unreasonable to expect you to remember all these things. If I, if I, if I, if, so so if, if it's not there, I can ask him to put it into it. Okay, And so we also know our generalized four term, force terms. Uh, and uh, okay, so just just to add into your question, sorry for stopping there for a moment, is probably want to look at the important problems on my video, okay? Uh, so just to give you guys some idea, okay? So we all we talked about all of these things. So then we basically have a, from our Lagrange equation, we want to calculate what's the kinetic energy, what is the spring energy, and our generalized forces. 
right? So we will not go through these derivations in detail, but I will try to walk through them quickly, and then we can look at it. So what am I doing here? In order to calculate my kinetic energy, I'm saying that I'm going to take a, I have my airfoil. Let's say this is my airfoil. I'm going to take a small infinitesimal length, and I can say the mass of this is dm. Right? If you remember, we defined our semi-chord, so we said this is x, so then we have minus b to plus b. So x equal to plus b, x equal to minus b. So if I'm going to take the sum of each of these small segments of mass dm, or the length of minus b to plus b, I would get my total mass, right? So my mass is nothing but dm into minus b to plus b, right? So, and I can also write my kinetic energy as we know, kinetic energy is nothing but half into m into v square, right? So that's exactly what we have done here. We have written, okay, probably we have written our velocity, I didn't probably talk about the velocity, but we will come to the velocity in a moment. So we have written our mass into some velocity square. We still have not talked about how we are getting this velocity, but uh, if you think about it, we have two motions here. One is the up and down motion. We have defined that displacement there is z, right, for the up and down motion. So we have up and down. Okay, sorry, I should use maybe. We call this as z, right? So this is also our displacement. That implies our velocity is nothing but dz by dt, or z dot. So this is for our up and down motion. So we said we, we have two motions. One is the up and down. One is the pitching, right? So second thing is we are saying that there's a pitching motion of theta. So let's say we defined our x. So now if there's an angle of theta here, so this is our distance x. And our pitching motion is nothing but x into theta. So we are, have a change in height. Let's say if this was height, so I can say tan of theta is nothing but h by x, or this approximately equal to theta, because I'm assuming small rotations, which leads us to saying that h is nothing but theta into x. Or in other words, now I can write the h dot, dh by dt, is nothing but x into theta dot. So x is the direction you know, along, the, along the chord, and theta is our pitching motion. So that pitching motion is changing with time. So my net change in height of my airfoil, or the net change in the height of my flexural axis, is up and down. Sorry. Net change is from up and down plus pitching. So that gives us z dot plus x into theta dot, right? So we have one motion because it's up and down. As it's going up and down, the airfoil is also undergoing some kind of a pitching motion. So my net velocity is nothing but z dot plus x into theta dot. Any questions on that or so far? OK, so if there are no questions, so that's kind of what we are put substituting in here as our velocity. So I'm just going to, what, I'm, what I have done here, I've just expanded the three. There's a, there's a square term, so I can expand it, a square, a plus b whole square is a square plus b square plus 2ab. I've just done that. And just to make things easier for me, I've written it as t1, t2, t3, and uh, looked at each of them. So as, as we discussed earlier, see, z, z dot is independent of the x distance, and I've taken it out. Same thing I've done for z dot and theta dot are independent, I've taken them out. So what we have here is this is nothing but the mass total mass. So this is nothing, then you have something like a mass moment of inertia, or first moment of inertia. So there's nothing but the first moment of mass. And then you again have, when you have x square into theta dot, you can get the theta dot outside, which gives you uh, theta dot square by 2 integral of x square dm. There's nothing but your moment of inertia, i theta, right? I just separated out the terms, three terms, so that I can write my total kinetic energy into three uh, simple forms, right? 
Uh, I'm happy to go through that in detail if somebody would like me to. Uh, but if you want to watch through the video, I also like talked about it in a little more detail. Like I said, I, I'm trying to focus more on the analysis of our equation of motion rather than trying to derive that itself. So then we have two springs. One is our linear spring. So uh, we have a linear spring that, let's say, the stretching is z. So half kz into z square. And then we have a rotational spring, uh, which is undergoing some deformation by theta. So that means that we have like half k theta into theta square. So that gives our spring energy, right? So for our Lagrange equation, we need three of these, kinetic energy, the spring energy, and the generalized forces. And we have tried to look through each of these. I will run through this extremely fast, but I'm more than happy to come back on that if somebody would have any questions. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, and lastly is our virtual displacement, right? So, or sorry, virtual generalized forces, okay? So we need to get our virtual displacement in order to get our generalized forces. So one thing that we have here is we have the, let's say we have the lift and the moment that are acting at our aerodynamic center. We can say that there's a virtual displacement delta z at the flexural axis. So the z motion and the theta motion, right? And we are saying the distance uh, eccentricity is E. So if you look at it, the lift is acting in upward direction. And uh, E is uh, Z is in the downward direction. Theta is in the upward direction. That's what we have defined so far. So because theta is acting in the counterclockwise, let's say if we go back here. Uh, or what's that? Yeah. So if you look at it, theta is acting in the counterclockwise direction. So and then, but the Z is acting, Z positive is in the downward direction, right? So I can say the net change is z minus e into theta. That's essentially my change in the uh, displacement of the flexural axis. Okay. That would give me some kind of a virtual displacement, and eventually we are able to get our virtual work. Without any loss of generality, let's just assume this to be zero in a way. Right? So let's assume that the pitching moment acting on the aerodynamic axis is zero. We are not going to lose anything by doing that. We just make our life a little easier and be able to analyze the situation itself. Okay. So now if you're if you going to substitute everything, you get your generalized forces and you put everything back in here. So one thing that we probably saw is, I just want to point out, is none of these terms has any z or theta. If you see, it's half mz dot square half is theta, z theta, so there's no z or theta terms in there, there's no z or theta terms in there, which means any derivative with regard to that would automatically go to zero. So your dt by dz or dt by d theta goes to zero in your Lagrange equations. So I'm just, so we, this goes to zero, we are substituting them and substituting them and putting them back together, and you get your equation of motion, right? So that probably I took, took not more than 10 minutes or five minutes, but then there's something that you must want to understand and dive deep into it, I think you should be able to go through the video and have a look at it, and I'm happy to help you if you're stuck anywhere, okay? Okay, so I think the more important thing for us, and also another thing that we want to do is uh, we have written our generalized forces. Uh, any, any questions so far? Sorry. I know I'm running through some of these things in, in real, really fast, but I'm more than happy to stop by and stop and kind of elaborate in detail. So everything we need to, so everything we need to pass to, to get a good score in the exam is in these uh, slides, right? Yeah. Because I'm just, I'm just copying and pasting the slides directly as you speak. Sure. Yeah. 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 So even the recorded videos are essentially the same slides. I'm just writing them out instead of showing the slides so that it kind of gives people time to think about and understand it. So, so it, it's exactly as the videos are just the same slides. I'm not using the slide, I'm just writing. So, but everything that you need is in the slide for the exams. Okay? Okay. Uh, so last thing that we probably want to calculate out is the lift. We have not defined what this lift would be. And this is where the unsteady aerodynamics comes into picture. For example, when you have something like a gust, then you probably go, want to go back into your aerodynamics course by Mustafa and see how he has derived the lift equations in there. I think that is something, uh, we'll try to look at a very, very simplistic scenario where we are not thinking of a gust, we are assuming there's some kind of a lift coming in there, but then it's not necessarily an unsteady aerodynamics in there, right? Because that makes our life more complicated. So we'll just write our usual uh, lift as like a dynamic pressure into chord length into coefficient of lift in a way. And this is the, nothing but our slope of the lift curve. 
and is our effective angle of attack. Since I'm more interested in writing everything in terms of theta and z, I also want to write this theta in some way. So I have the velocity, I have the change in the height, let's say h, and this is my effective velocity, let's say v effective. So that would also be like we can say tan of theta is nothing but h by v, or sorry, not h, there's a sorry, z dot by v. So we have upward motion and there's airflow in this direction. So that should give us our effective angle, uh, pitching angle as well. So that's kind of what I've taken here and put it into the lift coefficient in order to, I want because I'm interested more in writing everything as much as possible in terms of z dot and theta dot in a way, right? Okay, so now, okay, so this should be z dot, z dot. I'll correct that error. So I'm just substituting everything back into the equation, and we have our final equation of motion, right? So this is the simpler mathematical jugglery that we have done so far to get our equation of motion. Or I can rewrite this entire thing into a matrix form, so where we have the mass matrix, so there's nothing but our mass matrix, our damping matrix, and our stiffness matrix. Okay, so one thing that we probably have, if you notice, is our right hand side is zero here. So there are no forcing function. No forcing function. Okay, so now is the interesting part, I feel. So uh, if we had something like a gust coming in, right? So then this is where you would put in, you would not have a zero, but that's where you'll have an additional force coming into picture. Then you would be solving it just like any other uh, two degree of freedom system that uh, Dr. Oyadiji has done in earlier part of the course. Right? So we have two degrees of freedom. One is the Z motion and one is the theta motion. So you already have done several two degrees of freedom system. This is very similar to that. By the end of the lecture, we'll try to generalize this. So and we, we also did this thing kind of like a like free vibration. And uh, essentially on the right side, if you have some force, then you're doing a forced vibration which is what you have done throughout the course in a way, right? So for now we assume that there's no gust or no other complicated aerodynamics coming into picture and we said that that's zero and we want to see what's the implication of this. Second thing if you noticed, our stiffness matrix is unsymmetric. So we will try to understand the implications of these as we go ahead. And our damping matrix is also unsymmetric. And another interesting thing, if you noticed, is that our damping matrix depends on Q. So Q is nothing but our dynamic pressure, which depends on the velocity of airflow. Which means, if you think about it, as the velocity changes, that means our damping changes. Right? So if the velocity increases, so an important question to think about is as the velocity increases, how does the damping change? As I said in the start of the class, we had this wing doing this aircraft wing, and suddenly it starts to do this, and this, and this, and then it flies away. Which means initially the damping was, let's say, positive. There was some damping happening. And as it goes into uncontrolled oscillation, you can think of damping as negative, because oscillations are increasing uncontrollably. Which means somehow our damping matrix there is related to the Q there, which is related to the velocity of airflow, right? So we want to understand well, how is this affecting the overall flutter behavior, right? So writing this equation of motion is just like the simplest thing in a way to kind of like just mathematical jugglery. But what is more important is to understand what this equation of motion means in terms of, let's say, as the velocity increases of the airflow increases, okay? Okay, so let's start with a very simple uh, situation. Let's assume that our damping is zero. So let's assume, sorry, not damping is zero. Let's assume that Q is equal to zero to start with. Right? Let's assume that there's no forward motion. Okay? So then, and that would automatically, let's say, remove our damping. So if you look at our damping matrix, if Q is zero, this goes to zero, this goes to zero. So we don't have any damping matrix anymore. And this term also goes to zero, this goes to zero. So if you, now we don't have a damping matrix and our stiffness matrix is now symmetric. 
right? So we are trying to make our situation simple. What if there is no forward motion? or q is 0, in which case, how do we look at the scenario? What would happen in there? Then we will try to see what would, what would happen if q is non-zero. How would that affect the overall aerodynamic and the vibrational behavior? As we know, as we have done several times, we assume that our uh, solutions are of a particular form. Z into z is equal to z into exponent of lambda t, same theta, right? So we are just going to use the same thing and substitute everything back. We get some kind of a matrix equation. And as we have done several times so far, we know that this has a tri uh, non-trivial solution if the determinant is equal to zero. If you remember, we already did it in, uh, in the first lecture of my first lecture as to why this determinant has to be equal to zero, right? So if this determinant was not zero, if let's say we call this matrix as A, we have a form that says A into B equal to zero. If determinant was equal to zero, then we don't have an inverse. If determinant was non-zero, then we would have an inverse. That means if inverse existed, then we can write a inverse into zero. And writing this is meaningless if the inverse doesn't exist. This, this statement is only meaningful if the inverse exists. But then if you multiply anything by zero, you always get a zero. So that is our mathematical reasoning why we said that the determinant has to be equal to zero. Because if the determinant is zero, then we can't do this, which means that there should be a non-trivial solution to our problem. Right? So when we say non-trivial, non-zero solution, right? And then we get what we call as our characteristic equation. I'm sure all of you could expand the determinant and write that, so I'm not going to go into it. But then if you get an error, just let me know, okay? And if you see, one thing that we want to observe here is our lambda to the power 4, lambda square. So what I did when I assumed that our uh, Q is 0 and damping goes to 0, was that I purposefully eliminated the terms that had lambda cube and lam lambda to the power of 1. Just to make my life easier. If, if the equation is in this form, I can assume la I can easily solve it like a quadratic equation. Right? If I rewrite this equation, I can just write this as a into some x square plus b into x plus c equal to 0, where x is nothing but lambda square. I can easily write in that form, and once I know this, then I know my solution easily, right? Minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac divided by 2a. So I basically want to make my life easy and try to see what is the implication of a lot of these things. My goal is not to derive these equations, right? I've, that is one thing, but then that's not the primary goal. I want to understand how the system is working. So now, if we look at it, we write this equation for lambda square, like what we did. So we assume uh, something like this. So we can get an equation for lambda square. So two things that we want to, now we want to start analyzing. The question now we have is, what is this lambda square? How is it behaving? Right? So is lambda now greater than zero? Is it less than zero? Or is it equal to zero? What is its behavior? That is our primary importance as an aerodynamic designer to understand what is this natural frequency. So we don't want to necessarily solve this. As long as we know if it's greater than zero, less than zero, how it is varying, we are more than happy with it. We don't necessarily need to know exactly what is the number. We want to know what are the boundaries. What is the boundary at which this flutter is occurring? And we want to be far away from that. Right? So we, as long as we don't know where the boundary is, we can try to stay away from that. We don't necessarily need to know exact values. You know? So, right? so now, one thing that we want to observe, one thing that we want to see is, let's say, for example, k, k theta, m theta, kz, i theta, s theta. All of these are terms somehow related to mass. Right? So k theta and kz are the spring stiffnesses. m is the mass. All of them should be positive. So you can't have a negative mass, you can't have a negative stiffness. Right? So second thing is i theta and s theta. So i theta and s theta are nothing but your moments of inertia, in a way. And they need to be positive. So each of these individual terms that we have in this equation are positive. Right? i theta is positive, s theta is positive, m is positive, k z, k theta, all of them are positive. But collectively, we don't know if lambda is going to be greater than zero or less than zero or equal to zero. Right? Is it going to be real or imaginary? We don't even know. Forget greater than or less than zero. By saying that, we are saying that lambda should be real. But we don't even know if lambda is going to be real or imaginary. Imagine if this was this term in the... Let me just erase this. If this term here... Let me make a blue color. 
for a second just indulge that this term was less than zero. The, the term that is under the square root was less than zero. That means anything uh, less square root of a negative number gives us an imaginary number. That means our lambda, or what we call it as our natural frequency, is nothing but imaginary number. Now, can we have an imaginary natural frequency? So, the whole implication comes down as to understand what is the behavior of this lambda. How is it changing? And then once we introduce the Q, or our dynamic pressure, airflow velocity, then we want to see how this lambda natural frequency would change with airflow velocity. Right? Without that, how is it changing? Then with that, how is it changing? Okay. So let's start to look at each of these individually. Let's take each of these single terms and try to dissect them and see if each of these is greater than zero, less than zero. So we can say the new, take the numerator separately and denominator separately. If both of them are positive or both of them are negative, lambda is positive. If both of them are, uh, one of them is positive, one of them is negative, then lambda is negative. If one of them is imaginary, then lambda is imaginary. Right? We have three scenarios, or let's say three groups of scenarios. One is both numerator and denominator are greater than zero. One are, are less than zero, which means that lambda is positive. One numerator and denominator are of opposite signs, which means lambda will always negative. Third thing is one of them is imaginary, which means lambda is imaginary. We have three scenarios and we want to understand where is lambda standing in there. Okay. So let's take a 10 minute break now and then we come back at uh, 11.55. Okay. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer and feel free to take a chocolate. Wait, are yes. You offered a chocolate last time because I mentioned a spelling mistake. Yes. Yeah. I look for the I look for the uh, today's state today's slides even further. Okay. And I noticed that on slide <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that on slide fifty five. Okay. <laughs> okay, no, I'll, I'll correct, yeah, okay, I see where you're saying that. Okay, I'll correct that, thank you. We get more chocolates. Thanks. Speaking of mistake, <laughs> I did find one of them. Give me um, one second, let me just mute the mic.
Okay, so let's get back to our equation of motion. So we had, so far what we did was we looked at the, let's say, a simple airfoil. We said that the airfoil is no longer just doing a pitching motion. There's some inertia coming in and the airfoil is also going up and down. It's also doing the pitching, right? So it's kind of like doing this complicated motion. If you go back to some of the videos that we had of the aircraft in the first lecture, you would see that the wing was not just doing the torsional motion, but it was also doing this, right? So we are trying to get as near to that as possible. And in that regard, we wrote some equation of motion. We did the usual stuff, usual thing that we do every time. We take the Lagrange equation, get the kinetic energy, spring energy, generalized forces, put everything together, did all the mathematical jugglery, got a matrix form. Right? And we wrote our characteristic equation, we took the determinant as zero, wrote the characteristic equation, which led us to some solution for our natural frequency. So now we have the, we have a question that even though that all the terms are positive, mass, spring stiffnesses, moments of inertia, we don't know if lambda itself is positive, negative, or if it's going to be imaginary. Okay? So we want to try to find that out so that we understand how lambda is changing if Q changes. If the velocity changes, how lambda is changes. We, for now, we started out saying velocity is zero, but then we want to add that complication in there. We start with life is simple, and then we make more life more complicated as we get older, right? So that's what happens, so it's just like that. Okay, so uh, let's look at, let's start with looking at the denominator, m into i theta minus s theta square. m is positive, i theta is positive, so our i theta is nothing but uh, our integral of x square into dm and s theta was nothing but integral of x into dm, right? All of these are positive quantities, but if we, we don't know whether the overall quantity itself is positive or negative. So, so if you remember your parallel axis theorem, so we know our uh, moment of inertia about the center of mass. So ICM is nothing but our moment of inertia. about center of mass, okay? And then from our parallel axis theorem, we know that if the, we said that the distance between the moment uh, center of mass and our flexural axis is some b into xa. That's what we said when we defined our airfoil shape, if you remember. So then from our parallel axis theorem, we can write i theta as a sum of that. We know again ICM or the moment of inertia about the center of mass is positive. I'm just trying to make some mathematical jugglery here. So if I substitute for all of these, so then essentially I would have m into bxa whole square minus s theta square, right? And I can also write my s theta is nothing but m into bxa, right? So uh, into, oops, I missed something here. m into ICM plus m into BXA whole square. Oops, no, no, no. Minus S theta is nothing but m into BXA. Right? So that's essentially we can just cancel both of these terms in a way and the square. And that leads us to something like m into ICN. Both of these are positive terms. So essentially, let's say our denominator is positive. Okay. I'll, I'll leave you to look at the video again to go through each of these things in a little more detail. But I'm just trying to uh, pick your curiosity a bit here. Trying, to, hopefully, I can. Right. So we know that our denominator is positive, <coughs> and we also know that let's say if we go back to our numerator. Let me just erase this here. So this term here and this term here are the same, right? If you look at that, let's say if I call this a, that is nothing but square root of a square, right? So both of them are same. So now if the other term, 4k, kz, k theta, m theta, i, m into i theta minus s theta square is positive, right? So let's say if this was positive, then that means that this is always negative, right? Because I'm taking, let's say there's nothing but writing equivalent to minus a plus or minus a minus some alpha. If this is positive, greater than zero, this and this are equal, then the square root has to be less than a, right? So a has, is always greater than square root of a minus alpha. Can I say that? 
right? So then I would always end up with a term there that says minus a minus square root of a minus alpha or minus a plus square root of a minus alpha. <coughs> and the second term is always a m square root of a minus alpha either way is always less than a. And we know that S m into i theta minus s theta square is positive because that's the denominator. We just know that that's positive just now. If you multiply by 4 into kz into k theta, that's positive, and you, right? That means that alpha is always positive. So a minus alpha, square root of that is always less than a, right? Or oh, sorry, a square minus alpha. Sorry, my mistake. So this is a square minus alpha. Right? No term like this, sorry. So it's always positive, which means that minus a minus a positive number is still negative, or minus a plus that number is still negative because a is still greater than that term. Which means that our numerator is always greater less than zero, right? So our numerator is always negative, and our denominator is always positive. Which means we were not looking at lambda there. So we have lambda square equal to a negative number divided by a positive number, right? Which is nothing but a negative number. But then we have a square here. So if we take a square root of a negative number, you can say it's always imaginary. Yeah, yeah, true, try, true. So it's always imaginary, right? Because you have the i. You're absolutely correct. So we are saying that our lambda, whichever we call as natural frequency, is always imaginary. Right? Doesn't sound correct. But, but we'll try to understand why it is imaginary. Okay? As we go next. Any questions so far? Okay. So if lambda was imaginary, then I can write lambda to be of the form a plus ib. Right? Would you agree? So a, is, uh, a and b are real numbers. i is our uh, square root of minus 1, so we can write as a plus ib. Which means that if I just think of my solution is of the form z equal to z into exponent of lambda t and substitute for lambda, and rewrite this, I can write z exponent of a t into e e epsilon exponent of i beta t. What is of interest to us is that exponent of a t. If you think about it, if A is positive, with time, this is going to grow very fast. It's going to increase rapidly. If A is negative, this is going to decrease very fast. Right? So if our B is representing nothing but our frequency of oscillation, but A is saying, how fast is this going to damp out? So if A is greater than, less than zero, then we have a stable system. If A is greater than zero, an unstable system is going to oscillate uncontrollably. So our A equal to zero is our boundary of flutter. Right? So this gives us one very simple metric. If I'm able to calculate lambda, and if I know what this real part of that is, that will tell me if the system is stable, or it's going to go into an uncontrolled oscillation. All we want to understand is what is this boundary at which it's going to happen. Still now, we have assumed that there's the airflow velocity is zero, but next step we want to consider that and see how that changes this thing. So it's a very interesting thing, even though we are take, saying lambda is uh, in, you know, imaginary, there are two parts to it. One is the damping part of it, one is the frequency part of it, right? Okay, so if we think about it, or uh, that means now we had lambda, like, like uh, my good friend said there. So we had lambda square as some negative number, which means I can write lambda equal to some plus into i omega and, and minus i omega. Exactly, exactly. Right? Yeah. And if you remember back our equation here, let's say, let's go back to our equation for our uh, uh, lambda. We have a plus or minus here, which means. 
Exactly, exactly, perfect. So uh, we say if we say lambda square is equal to a plus b, right? And lambda square is also equal to a minus b, right? Which means lambda can be square root of a plus b, or lambda can be square root of a minus b. Again, you would have a plus or minus here. If you remember, we had an equation in lambda to the power 4, which automatically means that there needs to be four solutions. So that's what we have here, plus or minus i lambda 1 and plus or minus i, la I sorry, plus or minus i omega 1 and plus or minus i omega 2. So omega 1 or omega 2, each of these are representing, one is representing your heaving motion, which is up and down motion, one is representing your pitching motion, right? So we have not yet talked about how these two are coupled. For example, if you, if you remember back our equation which, which we started out with, let's go back to our matrix equation. So we only have some coupling here, right? Which means if z changes through s theta, that will change theta. And if theta changes through s theta, that will also change z. But then there's nothing in the stiffness matrix that is coupling the z motion and the theta motion, okay? So let's go back here. Yeah, sorry for going back and forth. Really sorry about that. Which means that our coupling is purely coming in from. Uh, no, not this one. Yeah, yeah. So our, we, we saw that so our coupling is purely coming in from our mass matrix. Right? So it's what's called as an inertial coupling. So for example, let's say if we went, once we add in Q in there, there'll be some coupling through our stiffness matrix. Our stiffness matrix, the two terms were zero, which means this, there's no coupling from stiffness matrix, stiffness part of the structure itself. So the stiffness of the structure itself is not contributing for the heaving motion to influence the pitching motion. So if there was no coupling, then you can say this, there's this motion and these motions are completely uncoupled. But from the mass matrix, we have some kind of coupling. So if there was a heaving motion, it also lead to a pitching motion automatically because of inertia. That's our inertial uh, coupling, okay? Now, if we, if we kind of make a simple scenario again here, so we are kind of looking at one scenario after the other, so there's an error here. Uh, thanks for somebody to pointing out. So if we assume that our center of mass coincides with our flexural axis. Let's think of a scenario. So we have this equation of motion, and what we are trying to throw around is what if this happens? What if that happens? What if another thing happens, right? So initially we started saying, what if the velocity itself is zero, right? What would happen? We still have a coupling. So there can be still be pitching and there can still be a heavy. What if the center of mass itself coincides with the flexural axis, right? So then that means our x into a, b into x into a would be zero. If you remember, this was the distance we defined as the center of mass, distance between the center of mass and the elastic or flexural axis. If this is zero, automatically our s theta would be zero. So s theta, was, we define this as nothing but mass into b into x into a, right? So immediately you would observe that our two coupling terms for mass matrix are now zero because s theta goes to zero. That is because the center of mass now coincides with our flexural axis. So now if you look at our equation, we have no coupling between the z and theta. So this, if this motion happens, it is not going to cause this motion. Or if this motion happens, it's not going to cause this motion. Both of these are independent of each other. Right? So the coupling between the terms, so if you look at your, if you looked out of the aircraft window and it is doing this, if you observe carefully, it's also doing this. That is because your mass, center of mass, does not coincide with your center of elastic, flexural or elastic axis. If, if you were able to design something that coincided, almost, I don't think it's possible, but if you come up with a design that's possible, then you would not have this coupling. So then you would have completely uncoupled motion. If this happens, it would not lead to a torsional motion. Or if torsional motion happens, it would not need to up and down, right? So this is the understanding that we have from the equation of motion. So we're deriving equation of motion is one thing. So what would happen if a lot of these things would happen in this, right? Okay. So second question is to identify which of this motion is happening, right? So most of the times we want to understand which of this motion is more dominant. I think there's some error in the slide as well. This was pointed out, thank you. So for example, let me, if, if the magnitude of the eigenvector of z, so z was our heaving motion, our heaving, and theta was our pitching. Right? If the z magnitude of the z vector is much greater than theta, that implies it's a heaving dominated motion. So it's not that they, they're completely uncoupled. Maybe there's also a twisting, but then heaving is more dominated. 
right? For example, if the eigenvector, magnitude of the eigenvector of theta was much greater than the magnitude of the eigenvector of z, then it's predominantly a pitching motion. You would probably see this more prominently than this. So we are always interested in which is the more predominant mode. So if you get the eigenvectors and look at the magnitude of them, then that gives you an idea of which of this mode is more dominant in this particular design. Right? So it's not, it's not that each of these motions are separate. All of them are happening, but one of them is more dominant than the other, or one or more are dominant than the others. And you want to identify which are these most dominant modes, and to identify the, if, they, if they go into uncontrolled oscillations. Okay. Okay, so let's, any, any questions so far? Any thoughts? Okay, awfully silent. Okay, so we have, uh, we made an approximation when we started out with to say that there is no airflow velocity. It's not realistic. Now, let's assume that there's some airflow velocity. Right, Q is not equal to zero, okay? If we go back into substituting our equation of motion, we can see that there are some damping terms coming into picture, and so our additional contributions into the stiffness terms. What is happening here is now we have a damping, which is unsymmetric, and we also have a stiffness, which is unsymmetric. Okay. Without loss of generality, just to make our lives easier, like I said, like I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid damping because I want to avoid the terms like lambda cube and lambda in my equation of motion, in my characteristic equation, because then I can use a quadratic, you solve it as a quadratic equation, just, just to make my life easier. Right? At the end of the lecture, we'll try to see how to solve a more generic problem. So let's assume that the damping is zero. Right? So I'm just again making an assumption here, let's assume that the damping is zero. We will try to see the scenario, I'll leave, I'll leave this as a, like, let's say an exercise for you guys to work it out, all the derivation. But then if we, if we, and see what would happen if you add in damping, make your life more complicated, try it out if somebody wants to venture into it, okay? okay. So let's assume that this damping was zero. But we are not neglecting Q here, so the Q terms, or the velocity and dynamic pressure, are still there in the stiffness matrix. So the stiffness matrix still remains to be, oops, I think I, I shaded it too much, okay. The stiffness matrix is still unsymmetric and still there's a coupling in the stiffness matrix. So alongside the mass coupling or the inertial coupling, we also have now stiffness coupling. We understood what if there's only a mass or inertial coupling, we understood that so far. Now we are making our life a little more complicated by saying what is the stiffness is there's also coupled, right? So there's some stiffness coupling coming in. So which means that let's say when you think of stiffness, let's say if you take a bar and pull it, then you have a Young's modulus, right? When you do the euler Bernoulli beam, you're looking at Young's modulus and moment of inertia in Young's modulus. Now if you're looking at twisting, then you're looking at your shear modulus. To some extent, how is your Young's modulus of this uh, structure affecting the, uh, let's say, the shear modulus of this structure? crudely to think about it, right? Okay, I will not solve this equation, but I'll leave, I'll leave you with the characteristic equation here. And again, now if you just want to solve them and plot them out, you will get an, uh, something like this. So we, as we see, we have still have Q, right? So we still have Q, which is our velocity or the dynamic pressure, not the velocity, but dynamic pressure, or some measure of velocity. If you are going to solve this characteristic equation and plot your omegas, which would be a natural frequency, you'll see a very interesting behavior. These, as the Q changes, when we assume that there's no damping, the omegas, both the, you have two roots or two natural frequencies, and as the velocity changes, they merge into one, right? So you'd see that these two, as, you, as the velocity increases, the, these two would probably come to a singular point. But now when you add a damping in there, when you consider the damping matrix, they come very close to each other, but then they again move far away. And this point at which these two, you have only one, what we call as one single, one root, instead of two. Right? So that's your point of flutter. 
In a way, so you, you had two natural frequencies, but now you have only one singular natural frequency. It's something like your resonance, right? So where the force, the vibration of, uh, let's say, the frequency of your force vibra of your let's say, system excitation is the same as the natural frequency of the system, in a way. So the frequency of vibration of the, both the pitching mode and the heaving modes now start to coincide. Right? So that's the point of flutter when things start to become uncontrolled. Now again, if you, I think this is there in the earlier slide, if you just plot out your uh, damping ratio versus the velocity, right? so damping ratio versus the velocity, as the speed increases, this increases. As you, if you remember, our damping was a function or our, func our damping was a function of the velocity or Q. Right? After a certain point, it starts to decrease and then it goes to zero. This is your flutter, critical flutter speed. If you think about it, when the damping, as long as the damping is positive, whether it's increasing or decreasing, right? So as long as it's damping, so whatever oscillations were there is going to damp out. Once it's zero, the oscillations are no longer damping out. And once it's negative, then the damping is not there. So it starts to uncontrollably oscillate. The, if you can identify the point at which the damping goes to zero, that's your critical shutter point. Or if you solve for your characteristic equation and, uh, as a function of your velocity, you will see that at some point, all, your, all the solution, you'll have only one solution rather than two solutions. And that's your critical shutter point. Okay? So, uh, or what's called as a flutter boundary. So this is the same thing that we were discussing earlier when we said lambda is A plus IB if lambda A is greater than zero or A less than zero or A equal to zero, right? So if you can get your solution, then if you look at the real part of it, that is going to tell you if the flutter, if the system is stable or if the system is unstable, okay? Any questions so far? No? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Which one? This left one or right one? Oh, so this is the damping ratio. Sorry, my mistake. So if you, if you crudely think about it, your uh, damping matrix is, let's say, changing as a function of the velocity. So if you're able to calculate a damping ratio for a particular speed and plot it out, then it, that's the characteristic that you would get. Yeah? Any other thoughts? OK. OK, so let's kind of look at a general solution. So this is probably more directly important for your exams. Uh, sorry, that I had to build it up to come to here. So if we have a general solution, general system of equation, right? So we in the, in the, so far we assume that there's only a heaving motion and a pitching motion, right? So we uh, reduce everything to a two degree of freedom system. But now your system might have more degrees of freedom. It might be a lot more complicated system. Then you can probably write this as some, some form of a mass matrix into the, let's say, the acceleration plus some damping matrix into the velocities plus stiffness matrix into the displacements equal to, let's say, zero, or if you have a forcing function, right? So essentially, this brings us back into our equation that we have been doing all through in the vibrations course, right? So we are saying A is our mass inertia matrix, or B is, rho, or rho V B is nothing but our or aerodynamic damping, so there's some damping coming because of the aerodynamics. So D is coming because of the structure, structural damping, because of how the structure is, what's the material it is made of, right? Uh, rho V square C is the stiffness coming because of the aerodynamics, and E is the stiffness of the structure, like what's the spring of the structure in a way, right? If you can change it to the spring. So again, as always, we have basically assumed that our solution is some Y naught into exponent of lambda T. And uh, as usual, I assume that my mass matrix is positive definite, so it inverse always exists, so I can always write it. So I just multiplied everything by A inverse on all sides, right? And without loss of generality, I've taken my structural damping to be zero, right? So I said my structure doesn't have a damping in itself, maybe because of the aerodynamics, some damping is coming into the picture, okay? Just, just to make our life easier, and we can write an equation for our 
acceleration. So there's nothing but our accelerations. Right. And you already, you already done most of these things already. So uh, when we did our self-excited systems, so where we said our velocity is nothing but identity into velocity. Right. So just because we wanted to write everything in terms of displacement and velocity, we just put everything back in near matrix form, do all the mathematical jugglery, and eventually we end up with our uh, usual thing that we say determinant is zero. We get a characteristic equation from which we are able to get some solutions which will basically give us nothing but, there's nothing but our damping ratio and our natural frequency. As you can see, we have a real part and an imaginary part here, right? And essentially that's what we said, we have a real part, which is if uh, C, so omega is always, let's say, a positive number. If our C is, greater than zero, less than zero, or equal to zero. So this is our flutter boundary, this is our stable system, this is our unstable system, right? So now, uh, we want to basically use this, most of the time we are given this, uh, let's say based on the complicated structure we are designing, we might not necessarily be able to approximate it as our two degree of freedom system, like what we did, we said heaving and the pitching motion. We might have a little more complicated mass and damping and stiffness, which would probably be written in terms of our equation of motion like this, right? That this is our more complicated equation of motion. And if we are knowing this, then we want to find out if a system is stable or unstable. So then we are able to write our characteristic equation, get the roots from that. And we want to have a very simplistic way of being able to uh, say if the system is stable or unstable. Okay, so if you look at it, so what I've rewritten here is I've written, we can consider our characteristic equation of this particular form. If you remember, we had this fourth degree of e e fourth degree equation, we did not have the terms lambda cube and lambda because I purposefully omitted the uh, uh, damping and to make my life easy, I had lambda to the power four, lambda square and b naught. Some, so b4, b3, b2, b1, b0 or some coefficients of this characteristic equation. Now, if I know this characteristic equation, can I easily find out if the system is stable, unstable? When is it going to become unstable? What is the flutter boundary? What are the flutter frequencies? That's our whole goal, right? So we want to always find that. So let's assume that we know the roots of the flutter boundary. We, um, uh, we know that C equal to zero. We know that lambda equal to I into omega. And we can say lambda can be equal to plus I omega or minus I omega, right? So if I am going to substitute this plus i omega and minus omega into this typical form of a characteristic equation, I've just taken that as a typical form, I don't know what b1, b2, b3, b4 are, I want to find a condition that if I know the characteristic equation, which is of this particular form, when will my flutter occur? And what is the flutter frequency? I want to find some condition for that, right? So that's my goal here. If I'm going to substitute lambda is plus i omega and I substitute lambda is minus i omega, I get two set of equations. And I'm just going to do some mathematical jugglery here. I'm going to sum up the two equations and subtract one from the other. If I do that, I get two more equations that are much more simpler, both are in the real form rather than in the imaginary. That leads me to, from here I can easily write, B1 is nothing but B3 into omega square, or omega is nothing but B1 by B3, square root of this. So this gives me the flutter frequency the frequency at which the flutter would occur. Now if I take this flutter frequency and substitute omega back here, I would have this equation which gives me a condition for flutter to occur. So what we have done here is we have basically taken some kind of any complicated system which are where we know the mass, the stiffness, the damping matrix, and then we are able to write the characteristic equation. We know how to write that into matrix form how to take the determinant equal to zero, and then we get a characteristic equation. And any characteristic equation we said would be of this quartic form, or of lambda to the power four, and if we know these coefficients, we want to have an easy condition to say that, okay, this is yes or no. And what is the flutter frequency, what is the critical flutter speed. So that's what we have done here. We have tried to take this system and uh, try to come up with, a, let's say, a, some kind of a simple equation. Let's say if this is the characteristic equation, this is the flutter frequency, and if this satisfies this condition, this is the flutter boundary. 
or critical sort of speed at which it would occur. So if I, if I go back and try to take my mass and stiffness and uh, damping matrix from the original equation of motion, try to put it into the, uh, this form, expand, write the characteristic equation, then I can easily write what should be the function of velocity here. Because we have Q, right? As a function of Q, how, uh, when would that change into zero? So when that becomes, when this equation is satisfied, that's the velocity at which the flutter would occur. Okay? So in, uh, alternatively, you can also, if you know the characteristic equation, you can also use the root for which method that you had already done in the previous classes as well in order to find if there's a stable point, what is the point of stability, and so on, okay? Uh, of course, one thing that we have not considered here is all our right-hand side was always zero, which means that we do not consider any kind of time-varying effects like gust itself, which is the time-varying forces that are coming in. Assume, of course, our system is changing with time, the velocity is changing with time. We did not assume that the lift or the moment itself is kind of changing with time because of gust, but whatever changes in the displacement and uh, the heaving and pitching motion definitely affects our lift, but we did not consider the other way around to some extent. Well, right? But that's kind of again going into doing a force vibration, you have everything just substitute a force on the right hand side and you would be able to do that in a way. Okay? Uh, Okay, so any questions so far? I, I know I have run through some of these things quickly. Like I said, this is not something that can be taught in like an hour and hour and a half, so there's more like an overview of the topic. And I walked through these things in a lot more slow, let's say, a you know, lot more slowly on the videos. And I'm more than always happy to answer any questions that are there. Any questions before we move into the problems. So just for the exams itself, I mean, uh, there's going to, of course, not going to be any derivations for you on the exams. I think that would be a bit crazy to ask derivations. But what would probably be there is definitely to kind of understand, take the equation of motion, try to define uh, when, the, uh, when the scenario can become stable, when the scenario can become unstable, what is the flutter boundary, what is the flutter frequencies, what are the critical flutter speeds. If you're given a system of equation or equation of motion, can you use that to determine when all of these things would occur? That is probably something of a, a thing that you want to look for the exam itself, to, but then you want to try to understand that. Uh, you want to know how to write this mass, mass matrix, how to write the damping, and how to write the stiffness matrix, and then be able to put everything together, uh, put determinant equal to zero, write the characteristic equation, maybe, maybe use one of these methods, say the Ruth Horowitz method, or the method we just looked at now, in order to determine what is the point at which the flutter would occur itself, right? Okay, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I think we have a few minutes, we can try to solve one problem, and then we can take it from there, maybe. Right? Okay, so I think this is probably the third problem in there, I guess, if I'm correct. So I've put in three problems in here for you to just work out, and I've also given you the solutions. The solution is just a one-line solution, but I would also post the detailed solutions later in the day. So. But probably you want to just work these problems out before you try to look at the solutions itself, right? So what this one is, okay, this is the, probably a second problem, right? I would not want to give you something with that because the assessment is not let's say, looking at how you can convert from feet to meters, right? Yeah. So the assessment is more looking at if you understand the concept, if you're able to kind of find, uh, understand what flutter is, be able to recognize when flutter would occur, be able to calculate that given a design rather than your mathematical jugglery of converting meters to feet. So I would not be very keen on that. Any other questions? Okay, so let me give you guys five minutes, maybe try it out, and then I can quickly try to walk you through that. Uh, I'll give you guys like five minutes. I don't know if did anybody try to solve the problems from these slides already? Had a look at it? Okay. Okay, let, let me give you guys five minutes, give it a try, and I think we still have time to sort through it. Uh, I mean, this is a much harder topic. I mean, in many of these universities, this is a pretty much a semester full course on just aeroelasticity, which is 
something that we have tried to put down into like four classes. So, uh, so when I was teaching at Berkeley, I was teaching vibration and dynamics. I talked about 35 lectures of one and a half hours. That was just vibrations. So, so that's a, this is pretty much a condensed version here. Like, but I think what Dr. Oya did, you probably wrote like six lectures, I guess. Six into two, 12 hours. So, so, so you, you can imagine so that like there's a huge amount of condensation happening here, so, or compression. Okay, let's take a couple more minutes. Has anybody made any headway? I'm sure some of you at least have. Maybe all of you. Wait, the thing is, the um, top left one is nine, right? Yeah, yeah, so nine V square. So 12 lambda square plus six V lambda plus sigma minus nine V square. 3v lambda plus 3v square minus 3v square, lambda square plus v lambda plus v square. So here we have already taken the equation of motion, substituted that uh, z is equal to some q into exponent of lambda t, and we have this equation. And all you need to do is take the determinant of this, get the characteristic equation, and use the condition that we just now discussed to see when the flutter would occur. That should give you what is the flutter frequency, and if you substitute that back into the condition, that should give you what is the flutter velocity, or crit critical flutter velocity as well. Okay. Any questions or do you guys need a couple more minutes? 
Okay. Okay. So let's try to solve this thing. So what what have, what are we doing? Like always, we have we use the condition that determinant is equal to zero, and we get a characteristic equation, right? So our characteristic equation, I've just separated things out. So we have basically like let's say 12 lambda to the power of four plus 18 lambda cube v plus 9v square plus sigma into lambda square plus 6v cube plus v sigma into lambda. Uh, color here plus v cube into lambda. So what I have gone ahead is I know that the form of my characteristic equation or the typical form of my characteristic equation is b into lambda to the power 4 or b4 into lambda to the power 4 plus b cube into lambda cube plus b2 into lambda square plus b1 into lambda plus b0 equal to 0. Right? So I've used this idea here in order to separate out the coefficients for each of the terms. So we know that's a typical standard form. And if we know the typical standard form, we know that the condition for flutter is this one. And if you look at it, we have some items in there or the coefficients in there which are functions of velocity. For example, if you look at B3, it says it's 18V. V is nothing but our airflow speed. Or in B2, we have 9V square plus sigma. Sigma is some stiffness. We already know that. And again, in B1, we have 6V cube plus V into something. On B0 as well, we have something like V square into sigma. So we can separate out each of these coefficients. So we have B4 is 12. B3 is 18V, 18, 18 into V. And B2 is 9V square plus sigma. B1 is 6V cube plus V, v sigma. And this is nothing but V square into sigma. right? I think I should be square and see. Maybe there's a mistake. Probably not. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, I need to check that once more. Okay, so now if I'm going to substitute everything back into the condition for flutter, so we have this condition for flutter which says now if you put everything back in there, you'll get an equation in terms of velocity, and I would leave the substitution to you, and if you just simplify that, you'll get a simple equation of this nature, which if you say this 3v square minus sigma, 3v square minus sigma, 30v square and minus sigma, I can say 3v square minus sigma into 30v square minus sigma. I'll leave the, let's say, the, uh, all the mathematical, uh, let's say, jugglery to you. So you can just uh, expand that and kind of group all the terms. And then you would get something, a very simple equation like that, which if we just expand from here, which if this has to be 0, then 3v square minus sigma has to be 0, or 30v square minus sigma has to be 0. Right? Uh, if a into b is 0, either a is 0 or b is 0. Right? So that's what we have tried to use the logic there. So the like of the form, a into b equal to 0, which means a is this one and b is this one. So one of them is 0, which essentially gives us some very simple, let's say, solution for what v is. And we already, in the problem statement, we had defined what is sigma. So we said sigma is some, some kind of a stiffness. And based on that, we can easily calculate what is our velocity at which, so this will give us our velocity. And now if we take the V and substitute back into our condition, into our, uh, let's say, equation for omega, what's our equation for omega? If you remember, our equation for omega was, let's go back here. Okay, so the equation for omega was square root of B1 by B3, right? So if I go back and substitute here, my omega is nothing but square root of B1 by B3, and mod B1 and B3, so let's say if we write, Omega is nothing but square root of b1 by b3. That will give us, so b1 is uh, 6v cube plus, plus v into sigma. And b3 is 18v. 18v, that is nothing but 6v square plus sigma over 18, square root of the entire thing. Now we already know what the v is, we know what sigma is. So if you substitute for that, that should give you your critical or flutter frequencies. So since we have two solutions in there, we get two different velocities at which flutter could occur. And which also means that two frequencies at which flutter would occur. Right? So essentially if you were to plot this out as a function of velocity, so let's say if we had some kind of a 
plot, then this would probably come in, and then there should probably be one, and then they would diverge, and then there probably there's another one, things like that, right? So that would be your flutter characteristic, so this was your omega, or flutter frequency versus Q. Or let's say if we just call it velocity, right? So this was nothing but at 60 meters per second, 189.7. need not necessarily be horizontal. Four and maybe something like that maybe. that would essentially be some, let's say, crudely somewhat our behavior. Okay. So if you are able to kind of get a whole range of velocity and how omega is changing, you take your characteristic equation if you solve for different velocities, you would probably end up with some kind of a plot like that. We are not interested, we were not interested in the entire range, we are only interested in what are these flutter boundaries and that is probably the reason why we kind of just looked at this condition to say what are these points at which we have two roots instead of four roots in a way, right? When, when do the roots merge in a way, right? And we tried to find these kind of flutter frequencies and critical flutter velocities. And uh, let's say, so this is a, let's say a typical problem that you would have where you are given like a mass matrix, damping matrix, and a stiffness matrix, and you want to understand what is the critical flutter, what is the flutter boundary, what is the flutter frequencies. Right? Any questions on this? Reasonably a straightforward problem. You are given the matrix, you do, you take the determinant is zero, you get the characteristic equation, and use that into the, get the coefficients, put that into the condition, that gives you the flutter characteristics. Of course, you can always, like, you know, solve for the different range of velocities, get the entire plot as well, if you're, if you're a little more keener to dig into it, I would say. Okay. Okay. I think we're pretty much on time, I guess. Okay. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And feel free to take a chocolate before you leave if you would like to. Of course, no obligations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Everything's fine with the mesh, it's just mm. the inflation layers. And this is the error that I get. Oh. Sorry, uh, Sorry, uh, okay. Sorry, just want to try it out of the flavor. Yeah. You know.